Hello everyone, it is a joy and a privilege to be with you on Christmas Day 2021. My name is Reino and I have the privilege of serving Fellowship City as pastor. I also have the privilege of opening up the word with you this morning. The theme for my Christmas message is simple and that is the wonder of Christmas. The reason why I chose this theme is because the saying goes that sometimes familiarity can breed unfamiliarity. That we become so familiar with someone or something that we actually become unfamiliar with it. And I wouldn't want that to happen to us and the Christmas story. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you call yourself one of his followers, I really do pray that you'll hear the story today, that you'll hear it loud and clear, and that you'll be filled with awe and wonder of this beautiful thing that God did for us. If you are not a believer in Jesus Christ and you don't call yourself one of his followers, I really do pray that the story would come to you today as the story that changed the course of human history. That it would come to you as the story that set in motion the salvation of all people and the restoration of all things. That it would come to you today as truth and not as a feel-good Christmas story. Before we open up the Bible, let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that we can open up your word today. Thank you that we can celebrate the fact that you chose to come to us. And through that, you fulfilled your promises made to us. Thank you that we can celebrate this as individuals, as families, and as a church family. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would attentively listen to you and that we would know what you would have us know, say, and do. May we be filled with awe and wonder as we study your scriptures today. And may your name be glorified through it all, Lord Jesus. I pray that in your name. Amen. So the shortest version of the Christmas story we find in the Gospel of John. It's a biography about Jesus, and it's written by a man called John. And in John chapter 1, verse 14, he writes the following. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's it. One short verse, loaded with language, loaded with image, loaded with centuries and centuries of human history. It's really deep, and we're going to take a nice deep dive into it. We are going to consider three things. First, the word became flesh. Second, he dwelt among us. And third, we observed his glory. And his glory gets described in this verse as full of grace and truth. So why did the word become flesh? Let's consider the story of the Old Testament really quickly. God tried with man in both Adam and Noah. He restarted and tried again with Noah after Adam sinned. After Noah, he restarted and tried again with the family of Abraham. And after the family of Abraham, he restarted and tried again with the nation of Israel. Every single time, the good and the beauty of what God created turns into chaos and death because of human beings' decisions to sin. And this time, at this point in history, God says, I am now going to sort this thing out myself. I am going to get involved personally. I'm going to do what no human being, family, or nation could do before. And that is that I'm going to save humanity. And through that, God becomes a human being. He wraps himself in a body like ours. And that's why it gets described in the Bible as he became flesh. It's difficult for us to understand. In, 4, sorry, in 451 AD, there was a massive uh, church meeting called the Council of Chalcedon. It was a meeting that lasted almost a month. And at this meeting, one of the things that the church wrestled with is how do we describe the incarnation of God? How do we describe who God is? How do we say that he is both God and that he is uh, also a human? And that's when they came up with a term called the hypostatic union. Hypostatic union is a technical term in Christian theology. This is a quote. 
employed in mainstream Christology, right? So Christian, Christian theology is what we say about God. Christology is what we say about Jesus. To describe the union of Christ's humanity and divinity in one hypostasis. That's a Greek word. Or in one individual existence. The most basic explanation for the hypostatic union is Jesus Christ being both God and man. He is both perfectly slash fully divine and perfectly slash fully human. Without mix. It's not a ratio. It's not like he's 50% God and 50% human. He is 100% God and he is 100% human. Think about the gospel stories. As a human being... Jesus gets hungry, but as God, he feeds thousands of people with five loaves and two fish. As a human on the cross, he says, I'm thirsty, but as God, he says, I am the living water. And once you have of me, you will never thirst again. As a human being, he sleeps in a boat and as God, he wakes up. And he calms the storm, both fully God and fully human. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 4 verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Isn't that phenomenal news? Jesus identifies with us fully even in our weaknesses, but that never made him sin. So whatever we feel, whatever we might be going through, Jesus answers us with, I know how you feel. I have been there before and I triumphed that and I will help you through it. Isn't it just marvelous that Jesus Christ is this God man, fully God and fully human. He became flesh. Now that was a radical statement in the time that this happened in the first century. Look at this quote from Tim Keller. He says, everything in the Hebrew worldview resisted the idea that a human being could be God. Jew Jews would not even pronounce the name Yahweh nor spell it. And yet Jesus Christ, by his life, by his claims, and by his resurrection, convinced his closest Jewish followers that he was not just a prophet telling them how to find God, but God himself come to us. Isn't that just beautiful? The word became flesh. God, God got involved himself. Personally, doing what he promised to do. Let's consider the second thing, and that is that he dwelt among us. So in Greek, the word that's used there is skeno, and that means that he pitched his tent among us. That's what it says. Now, tent should immediately link you back to the story of the Old Testament, because it's an image that comes from the Old Testament. In the book of Exodus, there was a tent called the Tent of Meeting, or its proper name is called the Tabernacle. Huge tent in which God's glory was visible and where God dwelt, where he lived, and where he could be met by people in the story of Exodus only by Moses himself. God pitched his tent among his people so that his people would know how important they are to him, so that his people would be able to see him, so that his people would remember his promises, so that his people wouldn't doubt in his existence or in his presence. He was with them in those circumstances. And now John, the writer of this gospel, says this happened again. God pitched his tent among his people again. I told you, or I'm telling you, that I saw this with my own eyes. You can believe it. I don't know if you've ever watched the episode or a clip from a series called Undercover Boss. Uh, the premise of the whole story is that a boss of a company would leave the comfort of his own office and that he would work on the lowest level of employees that that company has. 
So either in a factory or uh, working the fields of some sort or working uh, um, on a line uh, in his company. And then they would, um, they would give him some makeup and they would hide his identity and they would just introduce him as a new employee. And then at the end of the episode, they would reveal who he really is. And every single time in every single episode, when they reveal that this new guy that worked with you on the factory line is not actually just a new employee, it's your boss, people would react and go, what? I cannot believe that you chose to leave the comfort of your own office to come and work with us. This makes us feel so special. That's exactly what God did by becoming a human being and pitching his tent among us. He's communicating through that, that we are important to him, that he wants to be close to us, that no one can fall off of his proverbial radar, that he knows everyone and that everyone is important to him. Now check this, not only are we so important that God wants to be among us, we are so important that God wants to live in us. Just think about that. Colossians chapter 1 verse 27 says, God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, and here's the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. God became a human being like you and I. And he pitched his tent among us so that we would know that we are important to him. He wants to be with us and he wants to be in us. And then John, verse, uh, John 1 verse 14 also says that we observed his glory. We observed his glory and it gets described as full of grace and truth. So let's consider this last thing. God became a human being and pitched his tent among us so that we would see his glory. Now, God's glory, his weight, his presence, the Hebrew word kabot or kavod in the Old Testament. This is a touchy subject. If you think back about the Exodus story uh, that I just mentioned again in Exodus chapter 32 and 33, Moses says, God, listen. I really need to see you now. Like we've been going to and fro and we've had some really good chats, but it's time for me to see you so that I can tell the people who you are and what you look like. And then God says to him, dude, you can't see me. You'll die. My, I'm too heavy for you. My glory is too weighty. What I will do is I will hide you and I'll pass by and you might see a glimpse of me. That is how intense it was to see the glory of God in the Old Testament. Now think about the privilege of the words of John in John chapter 1 verse 14. Now we can all see it. It's not only reserved to special people on special occasions. It's open for everyone to see. And what does God's glory look like? It's full of grace and truth. These two things cannot be untied from one another when we speak about the character of God. The character of God, His weight, His being, His vibe is grace and truth. Just imagine yourself in a family like ours and uh, one of the kids acting out and needing to be disciplined. Here's what grace and truth looks like. If I could speak to our oldest daughter, Ava, what you did now is not right. It is sin and it is hurtful. It hurt both yourself, myself, mom and your sister. We have asked you before to not do it and I'm going to ask that of you again. Please stop doing it. Okay great, let's go and jump on the trampoline or let's go for our ice cream. That's what grace and truth simultaneously looks like. Think about this, guys. Grace without truth is compromise. Truth without grace is judgment. And that's why we need both. Both you and I long for it. And here's the good news. It is to be found at Jesus Christ and Him 
alone. It's not to be found in news. It's not to be found in social media. It is to be found with Jesus himself because that is who he is. Full of grace, come to me, and full of truth, you need my salvation because you are stuck in sin and in death. Full of truth, I'm looking for you and I want to be with you. Full of grace, I'll keep on looking for you and we can restart and try again until you accept me. Isn't that just a phenomenal, loving, gracious and awesome God? That's what Christmas is all about. Is the fact that God chose to become a human, that he chose to dwell among us and live in his tent among us and live in us, and that he showed all of us his glory and that we can know his glory as grace and truth. The story is told of a young girl called Jessica McClure. She was born in March uh, 1986. And in October 1987, she fell into a well in her aunt's backyard in Midland in Texas. Uh, there was actually a movie made about this incident. It's a true story. Uh, the movie is called Everybody's Baby, The Rescue of Jessica McClure. Now, rescue workers spent 56 hours looking for her in a well that was only 20 centimeters in diameter. So don't even think medium pizza think uh, smaller than a medium pizza and the well was 6.7 meters deep and the whole story is about rescue workers for 56 hours saying we are going to keep on looking let's just dig a little bit more let's not give up let's keep looking and how she is eventually found on the picture that you're seeing on the screen, you'll see a picture of her now as an adult smiling about her story, telling her story as a miracle story, telling her story as a story that ends with, I once was lost, but then I was found because someone kept looking for me. That's the wonder of Christmas to all of us as believers and all of us as non-believers, is that we once were lost. And that we were found because God never stopped looking. And his incarnation, God becoming a human being, was the decisive act in God coming to look for us. And not only did he look for us, but he revealed himself in such a compelling way. And he gave us an opportunity to respond to him. When you think about this story today, may you be filled with awe and with wonder. May you see a God who's always wanted the flourishing of humanity and who decided to get involved in it himself in person. May you see a God that is close, that knows you and that communicates to you that you are not unimportant to him. And may you see a God that is perfect in his glory, both filled with grace and truth in perfect balance and in perfect harmony with one another. May you see that in Jesus Christ, you will find everything that you need. And it all started with him becoming a human being and him becoming born. This is the wonder of Christmas. Let's praise Jesus for the fact that he became a human being today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are filled with awe and we are filled with wonder. If we think of the story of the Bible, if we think of where all this came from, if we think of your goodness, your love, your grace and your mercy, if we think of what it must have asked of you to leave your position of power and privilege to come and save us, we are so thankful today. I pray that we would um, dedicate ourselves to you once again. I pray that we would decide to follow you. I pray that we would believe these words as the truth today and that we would experience both your grace and your truth as we, uh, as we are together. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We praise your name. Amen. Mm -hmm.